Hey, greetings everyone. It is Gleekon, and I am back again, bringing you an evening record here as we can, as I promised earlier, we were going to get the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic art book, a kind of a more on the rare side book that I had to get a physical copy of, and I'm presenting it here digitally. Um, on the last episode, we, we messed around in the Barrens some today, and we'll continue that tomorrow on our, on our World of Warcraft walkthrough in this, in this show of mine, Lore of Warcraft. But before we get started on this, I'll give you the, the update. It is finally the information I've been seeking for the past few days has, has been received. And it was not good. So I didn't get the promotion that I uh, felt that I was entitled, not entitled to, but that I felt like I was qualified for. And I want to apologize to you guys for starting on this. And I, I will, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make every effort that I can to, to drop that, those type of things from my conversation. So I, I mentioned a lot about, um, where I would be, you know, the different, the highs and the lows, the different possible paths that would come out of this. And, um, I don't want to make any knee jerk reactions, but I will say in the, in the kind of gut punch wake of that, after I collected myself, I decided to pop on, I've been farming that harvester. And as soon as I pop on, lo and behold, you know who's sitting there waiting for old Glee console, the harvester. And I don't know if, if there is such a thing as signs or anything, but I'm going to take that as a sign that uh, maybe I should be focusing more of my effort and time, attention into this, which gives me so much joy. And I hope that any of you guys listening out there just hearing me ramble gives a little bit of joy to you too. And I hope if nothing else, maybe the, uh, seeing someone, you know, sometimes misery loves company and just to see, uh, someone go through a rough patch, you know, that there's, there can be something cathartic about that. So all that being said, you know, life's still pretty good. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'll be seeking some clarity but I, I did go and I started a Patreon. I haven't published it yet. I'm going to get things going after I get back from taking a couple weeks up in the mountains and, and really get my head clear. I'm going to come back and, and pour a lot of changes are into, into this show. Um, I'll start diversifying a little bit. I, mean, I think I'm going to start up a discord, start up a Patreon, start up a Reddit, maybe start up a Twitter all or an X all for this channel and start offering some of these things like these digital uploads and stuff on uh on some subscriber packages there's the assassin's creed uh journey that i'm going to begin on that too i have a lot of that all ready to go planned out i've done spreadsheets on that and and gotten pretty much all the materials already and I, i'm i'm excited to start that journey and I'm happy to be here with you guys to end my day with a nice little session looking at a really cool book. So without further ado, thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get started. So we're in the middle of uh, the kind of finale section of this book, and this part is called RGB lighting, and lighting is cool. It says most digital images as they appear on a computer screen are broken down into three channels red, green, and blue, RGB. An individual character model, for example, when rendered, is a composite of these three colors. Likewise, all lighting effects shining on the model are also a synthesis of these channels. In order to get their color and lighting effects as exact as possible, as well as to save time during the production process, BFD will render these final images so that each light will coordinate to one, will contribute to one channel. This way, they can be farther, further adjusted and tested after rendering rather than having to go back and re-render 
a figure just to make minor tweaks to lighting, which could take hours. This separation of the three lighting channels allows the compositor to fine-tune their influences on the scene. Adjustments can be made on the fly, testing out various solutions to real in real time to arrive at a final color and lighting scheme through a more dynamic process. Sorry for the stumbling over the words. It's kind of small script, even though I have it pretty zoomed in. Look development. On the opposite top, we had the RGB lighting composite. Opposite bottom were some RGB lighting layers. There were red, green, and blue from left to right layers, if you want to rewind, if you're interested in that. And above and right, look development studies for lighting and background. So you can kind of see maybe subtle differences in the background particularly. Besides designing lighting on a technical level, finishers also work to light the scene in a more traditional aesthetic and cinematic sense by embellishing sequences with layers of shading and lighting effects in a general process known as look development. Look development also encompasses adjust adjusting color and intensity as well as the placement of lighting and shadow, making it a somewhat loose process of setting the right mood for a scene. During the second pass in animation, finishers receive rough versions of scenes with the major elements and movements in the frame blocked out. Using these scenes, they work through the lighting options, determining the major angles and tonalities. When the final scenes begin cycling through during the third animation pass, which includes final meshes and sims, the finishers migrate their lighting schemes to these scenes and begin to integrate effects. This process of creating the framework for the overall lighting scheme during the second pass helps bring the final scenes to completion more efficiently. Additional tricks are used in this process of engineering the lighting to enhance the right mood and feel. One example is the use of cards in the final composited scenes. A card is a special highlight or other lighting effect that has to be separately designed and worked in because it falls outside the general lighting scheme. Basically, it's a little cheap for dramatic effect. Other examples of tricks the team uses to enhance the look of a scene include the specific use of light in or on the background images, effects, see page 142, so that I guess already passed, and the use of environmental atmospherics. Each of these techniques allows the cinematics team to shift the mood of a scene to fit the needs of the story and characters. This is very, 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 oh, here's the page that we're talking about. These are different effects they're adding on the sword. As you can see, the kind of frost is building over it. This page and the right, Frostmourne Effects Studies. They're hitting us with a lot of technical jargon. Effects are the essential little features that the cinematics team incorporates into a scene after other processes that add detail have been mapped out. These other techniques include surfacing from pages we, were, we already covered that, and look development, we just talked about it. For the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic, important effects include the icy breath of the Lich King, the glow effects inside Syndragos' body, the layers of snow and dust that swirl around the Dragon Hill environment, the power-up energy that travels up Frostmourne, the crackling of the ice, and the ice breaking over the Frostworm. Without these details, the cinematic would seem less dramatic. A particularly crucial effect that BFD incorporated into the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic was the blue frost energy that crackles over Frostmourne when the Lich King first unsheathes the sword. When the Lich King raises the sword, it is relatively dull. He steadies it and points it toward the camera, allowing it to absorb the surrounding cold and catch the snow and ice that falls from the sky and swirls around. Blue energy begins to course through the blade. Other effects in the cinematic are less noticeable, such as color, smoke, ice, breath, and all of the small surreal aspects that add to the scene. Without these subtle elements, the overall picture would appear lacking. The effects team works hard to ensure that these details are covered, completing the experience for the viewer. And here we have some more pictures of that, kind of in the in the large, as you can see, that sword absorbing the ice, pretty neat. Okay, and now we have rendering. I got a little glare there, but definitely different layers, colors. The yellow one looks like a transformer or something. These are examples of AOV passes. In the right coming up is an AOV composite with matte painting background. Rendering is the process of combining all the maps or surfacing elements to produce a two-dimensional representation, what will appear on screen, of a fully designed three-dimensional figure, e.g. the Lich King's model, rigging, and all the underlying substance that goes into producing the final 2D image. When a frame is rendered in 3D, the shaders perform various calculations to produce the final image, 
the shaders are programmed to output certain variables known as arbitrary output variables or AOVs to individual image channels during rendering, including the RGB lighting channels. Each light's con contribution is stored in a separate channel as are the various surface properties of the shader, such as diffuse color, specular color, reflections, ambient occlusion, etc. Once the frames have been rendered in 3D, the shot is assembled in a separate 2D composing compositing package. Adjustments can be made to light intensity, light color, specular head highlights, and reflections by tweaking the individual channels. The channels are then reassembled using the same match that the shader performed during 3D rendering. This process allows for many changes to be made quickly without the need to re-render the full 3D scene. The finisher is able to show changes to the director almost immediately to get feedback, allowing BFD to refine and perfect the characters and scenes with relative ease. If further changes are requested, it is a relatively simple operation to go back and revise the 2D sequence produced through AOV, allowing BFD continuously to refine their characters and screens without sequence without monopolizing substantial resources and time. Without the AOV process, if they were to re-render every scene for every change they'd like to make or review and process, production would be held up significantly. Yeah, and I can imagine, like, you have two screens, each, like, one of these is a channel, and as you can see these and tweak them, you can look at the final product and see how it's affected. I would imagine the software allows all of that to be a lot less technical in the heat of the moment. There's a pretty dope picture of the Lich King as a reward for us reading that. Compositing. And you can see we've got a background layer, we've got the static 2D image layer, we have a, uh, like a mid-ground layer, we have a texture um, from the environmental texture on the front. Compositing is the process of taking all the different 2D rendered layers that are going to make up a final frame in a cinematic. So if you, if you are familiar with math, it'd be working with like the planes, for instance. And collapsing them into one another to finalize the frame. After they're consolidated, they are adjusted individually by the compositing team to make sure they dial in the look. Compositors go through each shot and sequence to make sure that the lighting on the map painting in the far background matches the lighting on the characters in the foreground and the rendered elements in the mid ranges. Blending the various layers into a single seamless environment that reflects the intended look outlined in look development. See page 141. BFD does most of the syncing of the various layers in a frame by eye. By working on each image with this level of individual attention, compositors are able to make out different sections of rendered layers to apply localized contrast and make more specific detailed adjustments. Producing a color corrected and synced final cinematic is especially tricky when this process makes use of this level of subjective work because BFD compositors typically focus on sequences of six or seven shots at a time. All of them work within a set of general specs or ranges, but a final master sync has to be applied at the end of the compositing phase to make sure that all these segments match. And here you have a, that was a composite layering exploded view what we just looked at. This is different composite layers. So we have background map painting, snow background, snow on Arthas, that's this right here, oh, it's clockwise, foreground snow, the final composite image, foreground mist, glitch and frostmorn, oh, that's this one right here, with all AOVs and surfaces. So this is the foreground mist right here. That's pretty cool. Uh, and here we have the Northwest Symphonia and Chorus records the Wrath of the Lich King score at Bastyr University Chapel in Kenmore, Washington. It's pretty cool. Oh, we must be getting near. Oh, maybe we're not. I was going to say we're getting near the end. This looks like credits, but no, no, no. They're lyrics. Cool. The World of Warcraft, Wrath of, Wrath of the Lich King, the lyrics. O Thanagor, O King. Then there's a solo. On Karanir Thanagor, long live the king. More more Ok Angalor, may his, may his reign forever. More Ok Gorum Palam Raval, may his strength fought, fail him never. Choir Roman Alga Balog Al Enthu, first in battle, last in retreat. Korok Naboda, even in death, I got a Korok there. Ha, Ma, Da, 
Ma, ergo eu draco modo, which is Latin, raise this dragon now. I don't know why they have Latin. I guess they speak that in the World of Warcraft universe. Mok och gorom palaam, may his strength fail him never. Mor och krovol angolor, may his reign last forever. Thanagor, king. Mor och gorom, may his strength. Palaam ravel, fail him never. Specto sum presenti, Latin, see his power. Caligo, carelum, carelum, I can't read it. More Latin, darkened the sky. More och krovol angolor, may his reign last forever. Karanir Thanagor, long live the king. Karanir Thanagor, long live the king. World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King, the script, when he's on the throne, my son, the day you were born, the very forests of Lordaeron whispered the name Arthas, drawing Frostmourne. My child, I watched with pride as you grew into a weapon of righteousness, casting his spell. Remember, our line has always ruled with wisdom and strength, slamming sword into the ground, and I know you will show restraint when exercising your great power. Shadow over army reveal, but the truest victory, my son, is stirring the hearts of your people. Pan in, close up. I tell you this, for when my days have come to an end, you shall be king. That's actually pretty freaking dope. And if you think about the way they had to write that line by line with the images of the movie, pretty dang cool. I think we need to treat ourselves to watching the cinematic at the end. I think we have to. So, and we'll watch it again later, but I got we got to watch it one time. Sound. Three main sound features immediately stand out when watching the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic. Terranus' voiceover from Arthas's past, the epic orchestral soundtrack, and the sound effects. Voiceover. When BFD decided they were going to craft a narrative piece about the Lich King's journey to Ice Crown to raise Sindragosa, they also knew they wanted to be able to make evoke the Lich King's rich backstory of Arthas so they could underscore the stark contrast between the good that Arthas represented in his youth and the ultimate evil he has become. They chose to do this by ironically juxtaposing imagery of the Lich King's present with corresponding lines spoken by Terranus, Arthas' father, in a voiceover audio track. Soundtrack. The orchestral score to the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic exhorts listeners to join an impending battle and celebrate the coming reign of the Lich King. The music for the score was recorded by the Northwest Sinfonia Orchestra and Chorus, conducted by David Sabi at Bastyr University Chapel in Kenmore, Washington. This location is used to perform and record all of the World of Warcraft music, which is composed by Neil Acree. This use of a single composer, a contingent of established performers, and a regular verse venue has created a consistent, instantly recognizable soundscape that says World of Warcraft. Sound effects. In the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic, the sound the Lich King's hand clearing the frozen ground to uncover Sindragosa's resting spot is the sound of a hand brushing snow-covered ice. Likewise, the noise of heavy boots tromping across the ice was dubbed in for the Lich King's tread. To get these distinct no uh, noises, the sound department used Foley work, non-designed or found natural sounds. Once recorded, these sounds were incorporated into the temporary mix and adjusted in the final mix to make them stand out. Additional sound effects composed in sound design during the post-production were used to blend perfectly with these core sound effects. Here's a picture of the team, the Blizzard Film Department, and the Lich King Awakens Syndragosa coming up. Uh, now we're on the epilogue. He's saying, rise. So here we are at the end of a look at what goes into making a Blizzard Entertainment cinematic. The process has changed quite a bit over the years, especially as technologies have advanced and the cinematics team, also known as the Blizzard Film Department, has continued to grow. Throughout this evolution, the goal has always been the same, to amplify the stories of the Warcraft, Starcraft, and Diablo universes and provide what the team hopes is a visual reward for the dedication gamers have shown by buying and playing Blizzard Entertainment games. There is an overarching look and feel to all Blizzard Entertainment cinematics that has been carefully crafted through each successive release. Maintaining this look and feel while establishing new standards of quality challenges the team to push boundaries with each project it undertakes. As each piece needs to be bigger and better than the previous one, it forces the team to refine the production pipeline 
on an ongoing basis and work on developing skills while maintaining an awareness of evolving CG film production tools and techniques. The Wrath of the Lich King cinematic was no exception to the Blizzard standard of quality. It was a great collaborative effort that involved all of the departments, as well as many artists and technicians. This is a pretty tight-knit group. Several of the members have worked together at Blizzard for many years, and the team has continued to grow. The new members have each brought a unique sense of character and a level of expertise that have made the team stronger and better equipped to reach new heights. Speaking of new heights, the cinematics team, along with everyone else at Blizzard, believes that the Wrath of the Lich King cinematic pushes the envelope again as far as cinematic storytelling where World of Warcraft is concerned. However, the ultimate verdict lies with the players. As much as the team enjoys working on a cinematic, wrapping one up and hearing what everyone has to say about it is equally rewarding. At the same time, there's always another project on the horizon, and with it, another opportunity for the team to raise the bar for itself yet again. It won't be easy, but as with every other department within Blizzard, the cinematics team wouldn't have it any other way. Here we have the dual sword. Here's the colophon. We're not going to read that. It's just the different people that are uh, part of the cinematics team. This is the back of the book itself. The leaf, the end leaf. World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King is set in the bitterly cold continent of Northrend. For millennia, few adventurers have dared to explore this unforgiving land. Ooh, typo in the leaf. Yikes. And few, another one, few eh, still have survived to speak of its grim denizens. Apparently they forgot to edit this. Several years before the onset of the Third War, however, Northrend fell under the sway of a terrifying threat, the Lich King. Formerly an orc shaman named Nerjul, he had since been warped into a spectral being of unfathomable hate for the living. Discovering that he now possessed nearly limitless necromantic powers, the Lich King created an immense army of mindless undead who were forced to carry out his will. This army came to be known as the Scourge, for the Lich King intended to use it to scour humanity from the face of the world. But the Lich King's plan did not end there. During the Third War, he manipulated Arthas Menethil, the Crown Prince of Lordaeron, into taking up the Runeblade, another typo, Frostmourne. In doing so, the Prince lost his soul and abandoned all the, that he had sworn to protect. Murdering his father, King Ternus II, Arthas became the Scourge's foremost champion and defended the Lich King. Since then, one part of his mind has continued to direct the Scourge while the rest of his vast consciousness dreamed. Now at last he stirs upon his frozen throne. Aided by the Frostworm Sindragosa, the Lich King is growing in power, gathering horrific new followers and preparing himself for a final campaign against the living. It is here that the tale of his wrath begins, as does the World of Warcraft cinematics, that introduces the second expansion to Blizzard Entertainment's massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Now within the book, the end is a small hand-drawn comic called The Fall of Syndragosa. And we get that little treat right now. That's the actual in cover of the book. So the first page, it's it's got a little story. Here's a two-headed dragon. Long before, or just two dragons, the Great Sundering, the five dragon flights, red, blue, bronze, green, and black, were charged with watching over the budding world of Azeroth. Sindragosa was the, the beloved consort of the blue dragon Malagos, also called the Spellweaver, guardian of all arcane magic. The great black dragon Neltharion, the Earth Warder, has given dominion over the Earth and its depths. There's him reaching. With the help of the of goblin servants, Neltherian created a powerful artifact called the Dragon Soul. He convinced his dragon brethren to empower the disc, claiming it would thwart the impending invasion of the demonic burning legion. However, Neltherian betrayed his dragon allies during the legion's assault, provoking an apocalyptic battle in the skies over the Well of Eternity. And look, some of those almost look like a uh, theory. You know, this is before they were even an apple in their daddy and mommy's eyes. Malagos and Sindragosa joined the blue dragons in surrounding the earth water. They charged the black dragon. But Neltherian used the might of the dragon's soul to strike out, decimating nearly all of the blue dragon flight. Bam, bam, bam. Bam, bam, bam. <clears throat> the blast hurled Sindragosa far across the land, deep into the frozen north. Blinded and near death, Sindragosa sought desperately to reach the Dragonblight, the place where dragons instinctively travel to die. 
No longer able to fly, Sindragosa plummeted to the cold earth in the region of Ice Crown. The blue dragon gathered what remained of her energy and called out to Malagos for aid. Her only answer was the howling arctic wind as she struggled on, but the distance was far too great. Agonizingly, she realized that her spirit would not find rest within the dragon blight. Her life continued to fade away as her sanity deteriorated. In the midst of her delirium, Sindragosa's final thoughts turned to bitterness and hatred. Hatred against the Legion, hatred against Neltharion, hatred even against Malagos, but most of all, hatred against the world of mortals. And in her dying moments, Sindragosa vowed revenge. And it's that spirit that Arthas taps into. Dope picture of him and his horse. And that's the end of the book. So why don't we just take a little look at the cinematic? Let's just Google it. Let's look at the trailer because we just watched all this stuff. Let's do it. I want to see it now. Three minutes, huh? That's cool. I didn't realize it was three minutes long. If you've already seen it, go ahead and tune out. I'm just going to fanboy. The day you were born, the very forests of Lordaeron whispered the name... Arthas. The script we just read. background. Uh, now you hear the choir. Listen for the Latin, I guess. That was the sound they got. Found sound. image we've looked at. Our line has always ruled with wisdom and strength. And I know you will show restraint when exercising your great power. No. different effects that we read about them. And yet, these wing parts are, that's, a, that's an algorithm. But the truest victory, my son, is stirring the hearts of your people. I love how I love they did it. This, for when my days have come to an end, mm. you shall be king. They did a good job. They did a dang good job. And look at that. You know what? Here we go. We um, I start the episode emo, and all I have to do is spend, you know, half an hour or so with you guys. Reading about this game, taking a video at the end, and uh, this is uh, probably the highlight. The hap like you know, this is just good. That get my harvester drop. You know, life life is good, and I thank you guys for tuning in. We have another episode in the pipe, five by five, and I look forward to seeing you in the morning, making the next one. See you guys.